Okay, hello, my name is Justin Gordon and uh, I'm the Open Records Division Chief at the Texas Attorney General's Office. Uh, thank you all for attending the um, Public Information Act training today. Uh, this training is really has uh, three purposes. The first um, is intended to provide the statutory training that's required under Section 552.012 of the Government Code. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to provide you with a code that you will use to uh, sign up, go on to our website and uh, fill out and attend, fill out your attendance and receive your certificate for this training. Uh, the second is to provide a refresher for those of you who are dealing with Public Information Act issues on a daily basis. And the third purpose is to provide a resource for those of you who may deal with it on a less frequent basis but who want to be able to rely on this as a resource to come back to, uh, check and know what your requirements are under the Act, whether or not the Act applies to you, and, uh, and also to be aware of some of the common exceptions and the uh, common procedures. So this, the training is going to be broken up into the, uh, the headings here. Uh, first, background and legal requirements for open records and public information. Next, we're going to talk about the applicability of the Public Information Act, procedures and requirements regarding complying with the public information request, the role of the Attorney General under the Public Information Act, and penalties and other consequences for failure to comply with the Public Information Act. Basically, when you're done, we want you to be able to identify a public information request, know what the PIA covers, know what information is going to be responsive to that type of request, know basically how to properly respond to a request, and how to handle an, the Attorney General ruling process. So where have we been and where are we going? Um, I won't be surprised at all if the, those of you who are attending this training received more public information at requests last year than you ever had before. Uh, on the chart behind me, we have a, uh, a graph of the public information requests starting in 2001 and going all the way until 2015. And you see that we had just over 5,000 requests. Uh, these are rulings that our office issued in the fiscal year. So we started off right around 5,000 in 2001, and just last year we were over 26,000 ruling, um, rulings issued by our office, um, and that's just in, in one fiscal year. So we've seen a really huge increase in the number of, uh, of ruling requests that our office is receiving and issuing, and we expect that that, is, um, that means that you all are receiving a lot more requests yourselves. Okay, so we're going to start off with the background. Uh, a couple of these sections are so important that we're actually going to look at the text directly. And then as we go, we're going to apply that text to a handful of examples so that you can see not only how to identify a request, what the request covers, but then also uh, what to really be looking for as far as your procedures and, and how to make sure that you're properly handling that request. So first, under section 552.001, the entire Public Information Act is contained in Chapter 552 of the Government Code and Section 001 is the very first section and it starts off with a policy statement. I'm just going to read it for you because that's, it's really the, how important it is and it's the fundamental section for the entire Act. So, under the fundamental philosophy of the American constitutional form of representative government that adheres to the principle that government is the servant and not the master of the people, it is the policy of this state that each person is entitled, unless otherwise expressly provided by law, at all times to complete information about the affairs of government and the official acts of public officials and employees. The provisions of this chapter shall be liberally construed to implement this policy. In case there is any question about how the act should be construed, they repeat it again in the very next subsection. This chapter shall be liberally construed in favor of granting a request for information. So whenever we see a request come in, we're going to start off with the feeling that's contained in this section, that is the public information, the information that's responsive to the request is public, that it needs to be released unless there's an exception that covers it. So that's really important. That's what you start off with, with any request, is that the information that's responsive to this request is open to the public unless there's an exception that applies. So let's talk about what public information is. Uh, public information is uh, defined in the, in the government code and the legislature routinely updates this definition. Uh, that's why in this instance we have three slides to discuss the definition of public information. The legislature goes to some lengths in order to keep 
the definition of public information up with the uh, changes in technology, changes in the way that governmental bodies are doing business, and that's where we see these changes um, to, the public, to the definition of public information. So it means information that is written, produced, collected, assembled, or maintained under a law or ordinance or in connection with the transaction of official business by a governmental body, for a governmental body, if the governmental body uh, maintains it, has access to it, or paid to have it created, and by an individual officer or employee of a governmental body in the officer's or employee's official capacity. So very broad definition intended to capture all types of information that relate to an entity doing uh, governmental business. Uh, going on, it goes on to clarify what the transaction of official business means. So information is in connection with the transaction of official business. If the information is created by, transmitted to, received by, or maintained by an officer or employee of the governmental body in the officer or employee's official capacity, or a person or entity performing official business, or a governmental function on behalf of a governmental body, and pertains to the official business of the governmental body. That's a very long way of saying that if you're doing work, if the information that you maintain relates to the transaction of anything that your governmental body does, it will almost certainly be subject to and responsive to a request for public information. Uh, the act, there was some question whether or not uh, the Public Information Act covered information that was maintained in individuals' personal um, accounts. So for example, information that was sent on private devices or was maintained in private email accounts. And the legislature has amended the, the definition of public information to include um, any electronic communication created, transmitted, received, or maintained on any device if the communication is in connection with the transaction of official business. So the legislature has come back made it very clear there is no doubt that that type of information is going to be covered under the Public Information Act regardless of where it is. Um, when our office is looking at those types of issues, we always focus on what is the substance of the communication. Uh, when we look at a, a document, there's no difference whether or not that information is contained on a written piece of paper in a person's office or it's contained in an email on that person's personal cell phone. It's the substance that matters, not the medium in which it's maintained. And so that's a really big and important part of the Public Information Act. You want to make sure that you capture that information wherever it's maintained, as long as the substance relates to the transaction of official business. Official business is also defined. So we have uh, several definitions within the definition. And official business is, means any matter over which a governmental body has any authority, administrative duties, or advisory duties. So very broad. Again, there's not going to be much information that relates to work that your government bodies are doing that's not going to be captured by the Public Information Act. This definition has been amended multiple times in order to continue to capture and to make clear that, that all of that information is going to be subject to the Public Information Act. OK, so what are the forms of public information? Uh, I've already listed a couple, uh, paper, handwritten copies, uh, things in emails, those are all covered. Uh, so the Public Information Act includes a number of examples, paper, film, tape, magnetic, optical, or solid state stor storage. Again, there's no difference between a piece of paper and an email file that's, that's contained on a computer or a computer hard drive. And it's in any form, so audio or video recordings, photographs, maps, drawings, again, emails, internet postings, text messages, instant messages, or other electronic communications. Um, these are the examples that we provide. This is not exhaustive. Anything, again, that, main, that you maintain related to the transaction of official business is going to be subject to the Public Information Act. So again, that's a really big and important focus uh, that you keep an eye on and watch out for those types of records wherever they're maintained. Okay, if most of you who are attending this training uh, you're here because you are either a government official, you work for a governmental body, and so you know that the entity that, you're, um, that you work for, that you represent, is a governmental body. Um, but for requesters, it was important to identify the types of governmental bodies who are subject to the Public Information Act. And so the Public Information Act includes a laundry list of entities that are subject to the Public Information Act. And here they are. Um, it includes state agencies, cities and counties, school districts and school boards, utility districts, police departments and sheriff's offices, public universities, 
county commissioners courts, municipal governing bodies, local work workforce development boards. The one carve out that the act makes is it does not include the judiciary. So the judiciary has its own rules related to the access um, to court related records. And so the judiciary is not subject to the Public Information Act. That's the one primary court, uh, um, carve out. Otherwise, uh, most entities doing, doing governmental work are gonna be covered under the Public Information Act. Okay, so that's the background on what the act covers and um, who, is, who falls under and is required to respond to Public Information Act requests. Now we wanna look at what is a Public Information Act request. It's really important that um, every member of your governmental body knows how to identify a Public Information Act request. We're gonna talk about how Public Information Act requests can be received in a moment. So what are the limits of a Public Information Act request? There are not very many of them. The first is that it must be in writing. That's easy. The second is it must, must ask for information that is in existence at the time the request is received. Uh, so take from that, you're not required to create new records in response to a Public Information Act request. You can, it often is beneficial to requesters to do that and it can make it easier for your government body to do it, but you're not required to create new records. There's no requirement to answer questions. So if a if an entity asks you a question, you're not, you're not required to respond to it. You're only required to make a good faith effort to relate that question to records that you maintain. And there is no requirement to perform legal research. So you're not required to receive a Public Information Act request, forward it to, you, to your legal department for them to provide an answer or, a, um, or legal research on. So those are the limitations on what you're not required to do under the Public Information Act. That's about it. There are no magic words required. They do not have to say this is a Public Information Act request. They do not have to refer to the government code. All that they have to do is submit something in writing that asks for information. Uh, it can be typed or handwritten. Uh, we've seen them in all forms. Uh, email is the most common now, but we're still seeing them come in um, written on a napkin. And you cannot require the use of a specific form to submit a request. However, it's very important to note that you can recommend and provide a form. Many requesters um, do not submit public information at requests very often, and so they are very appreciative when a form is provided and it can help you and it can help them. For example, when requesters submit something uh, in hard copy, they may not provide you with a phone number or they may not provide you with an address. And that type of contact information is really critical for working with requesters on getting them the records promptly. So it's a good idea to have a form, but you are not permitted to require the use of the form. A requester can submit a request in any form as long as it is in writing. <clears throat> what if the request is unclear or unduly broad? Uh, requesters can ask for anything that they want to under the Public Information Act. They're not required to, to uh, limit themselves. But the Act does provide you with some tools in order to respond to a requester who's sought a voluminous or broad amount of information. Before I get into what, how you can clarify a request, I want to make it very clear, you cannot ask a requester why they want information. That is specifically prohibited by the Public Information Act. It doesn't matter why they want it and you're not permitted to ask them why they want it. Some requesters will tell you, but you, uh, you cannot ask them why they want the information. However, you can ask a requester to clarify a request or to narrow a request. Um, it's a very important tool to have in your toolbox when working with requesters. Working with requesters is really the best thing that you can do in order to reduce the burden on a governmental body in responding to a public information request. When a broad request comes in, that requester may not realize how you maintain your records and, and may not realize how difficult it might be to, for the, to obtain those records, may not realize that they may have to pay a fee to obtain them. And so reaching out and speaking with requesters directly by telephone, by email, really goes a long way in working through these issues under the Public Information Act. So if you take anything away from this other than the statutory training and, the, and those core elements that we're, that we're talking about, if you're a person who's dealing with requesters under the Public Information Act, really go out of your way to provide good customer service and go out of your way to reach out to them and contact them as early as you can in the process 
getting working on those issues will really go a long way in, um, in handling these uh, requests that are um, unduly broad or for large amounts of, of information. So you can reach out to and ask a requester to narrow or clarify. Some examples of ways to narrow or clarify a request. A requester may ask for, I would like all records related to a particular individual. Well, that person may have worked there for 20 years. So you can provide a time, a time frame in order to narrow a request. Or they may ask for, I would like all information in a particular division. And that division may maintain millions of records. It's a good idea at that point to contact the requester and see if you can uh, narrow or clarify the scope of that request to identify particular subject matters along with dates or maybe particular uh, people who may have worked on something in order to uh, narrow that, that focus of, uh, of records. When you clarify a request, if you clarify it in good faith, um, pursuant to a court decision, you receive a updated, updated deadlines. And so the 10-day deadlines that we're going to start, start, uh, talk about and go through in just a moment, they restart when you receive the clarification. So that's also a very important tool. Again, you have to make sure that that, re that request for clarification is made in good faith. If it is, then again, when you receive that clarification, your deadlines start over again and you pick right up where you, uh, where you left off. Okay, so pop quiz. I've uh, given you guys some uh, examples of requests. Don't worry, it won't be graded. We're going to go through sample requests and just want to give you an idea of what some of these requests look like, the common things that we'll see, and we can determine whether or not these are public information requests. So let's look at this first one. John Smith's personnel file pursuant to the U.S. Freedom of Information Act, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, and open records laws of the European Union. So as a governmental body, uh, governmental bodies in Texas are not subject to the Freedom of Information Act and they're not subject to the laws of the European Union, but does that matter with respect to making a Public Information Act request? No, it does not. All that's required is that it be in writing and it asks for information. And in this case, we've received it in writing and it's asking for a personnel file. So you're going to have a, a public information request there. Handwritten. I want all records involved in report number 225436-96, signed Bob Scrawl and his address. Um, handwritten, looks like it might be on a napkin or at least written sideways. Is there any issue with this being a public information request? No, so this is a public information request. It's in writing and it's asking for, um, it's asking for information. So we have, a, we have the act triggered here as well. Any and all documents pertain to Jane Smith, including but not limited to communications sent or received by her in the past five years. So, request is in writing, request is asking for information. We have a public information request here. This one though should be, should put up a flag. This is asking for a lot of information, right? Uh, presumably Jane Smith, if she had been there for five years, is going to have a large amount of communications that she sent in five years and every record pertaining to her could be a voluminous amount of information. This is the type of request where you'd like to get on the phone or put together an email in order to respond to that requester and begin working on narrowing or clarifying that request. Uh, because that requester may not realize that Jane Smith had been there for 20 years. That requester may just want to know what Jane Smith has been up to or want to see information pertaining to a particular file that occurred in the last month. And so you really want to reach out to the requester and clarify without asking why they want the information but really trying to find out what they're seeking and see if you can narrow down and clarify that, that type of request. <clears throat> Any and all communications Jane Smith sends or receives over the next 30 days starting tomorrow. <laughs> this is a public information request. So this is in writing, it's asking for information, but this information doesn't exist yet. So you're not required to create information but you're also not required to respond to a rolling request for this type for, uh, of this type. So if a request seeks information that you maintain now, you have to respond to it. If it seeks information that you're going to create in the future, you're not required to respond to that. Um, it might be a good idea to, to notify the requester that you're not required to respond to that type of request and to ask them to submit that request in the future in, in an ongoing basis. But you're not required to respond to this type of rolling request. 
all of Jane Smith's evaluations because I'm considering going into business with her and would like to know about her personal background. Okay, so in this instance, the requester has told us why they want the information. Still a Public Information Act request? Yes. So in this instance, we have a request that's in writing and they're asking for Jane Smith's evaluations. This requester has told you why they want the information. They're not required to do that. You're not required to ask them why they want it. But it also doesn't matter why they want it. Uh, regardless of the reason that the requester provides, if the requester voluntarily um, informs you of the reason they want the information, you are still required under the Public Information Act to respond to that request as you would respond to all other requesters. So it's important to, uh, uh, to disregard the reasons that they want the information. Okay, so here's the last one. What are the legal requirements to appeal a court's ruling? Also, do you think I should appeal my case? <laughs> you might want to answer the question, but you're not required to. You are certainly not required to perform legal research in response to the first, um, to the first request for legal research. Uh, that, again, is a that's a very clear example of a request for legal research. Uh, the second part of the request is a factual question asking you to provide an opinion. Uh, you are not required to provide an opinion, and it would be very unlikely that a, any government body would have documents responsive to that. So that's the type of example where you're going to have a request for a, um, to answer a factual question. Again, it's, you are not required to do that under the Public Information Act. So what do you do when you receive a request? At the core of the Public Information Act, you promptly respond to it by providing the information to the requester. You can also I'll permit the, ins the inspection of the information. So you have, there are two options that requesters have. They can receive copies or they can, ins they can inspect the records. There are, those are important distinctions because there are very different procedures for inspection and for requesting copies um, that we'll talk a little bit about at the very end of the presentation. If you're not going to produce all of the information responsive to the request, then with very few limitations, you must ask the, the uh, uh, Attorney General's office for a decision and ask um, our office for permission to withhold that information from the requester. And how much time do you have to produce the information? The Public Information Act says promptly. Uh, promptly is defined in the Public Information Act not in a number of days, but with a, um, with a definition that really depends on the factual circumstances that are applicable to that governmental body. Specifically, it means as soon as possible under the circumstances, that is within a reasonable time without delay. That really depends on the circumstances for your governmental body and on the type of information requested. Let me give you a couple of examples. Governmental body receives a request, the public information, the public information coordinator reviews the request and the request is for a, uh, a contract. And that contract just happens to have been requested last week and the public information coordinator has already reviewed it, released it, and it's sitting on the public information coordinator's desk. Promptly, in that case, is going to be very, very soon, right? If the public information, if the public information coordinator receives a request for all emails sent or received by uh, a named individual, and that named individual sent 5,000 emails that are responsive to the request, promptly means something different than it means when that contract is sitting right there on the desk. The biggest takeaway on what promptly means is it does not mean 10 business days. If a requester asks you how much time you have to respond to a request, it is critical that you do not respond to them by saying 10 business days. There's a misconception that, that promptly means 10 business days. 10 business days uh, aligns with several procedures that are under the Public Information Act, including when you have to request a ruling from our office and when you're the last notice that you have to provide a requester on when records will be available. But promptly does not mean 10 business days. So really important takeaway. If you cannot produce the information within 10 business days though, you are required to notify the requester. In your, in your notice to the requester, you must state that the information is not available and you must provide a date and hour at which, the, at which time the information will be available. So again, promptly really depends on the facts 
specific to your governmental body at the time that you receive the request, along with the information that's responsive. But again, very important, promptness is key, and customer service goes a long way in working with requesters. Get those records out as quickly as you can, and you'll be in really good shape. <clears throat> How much time do you have to request a decision from the Attorney General? 10 business days. So within 10 business days of receiving a request, you must notify and request a ruling from our office that you wish to withhold the information. You must request that decision within 10 business days unless you have a previous determination that applies to the information. Uh, any governmental body who's here has received a previous determination. We have two types of previous determinations. These come from an open records decision uh, that our office issued in 2001. It's open records decision number 673. Type 1 is the most common. Again, any governmental body who's ever received a ruling from our office has a previous determination. Uh, type 1 permits uh, the withholding of a particular record by a particular governmental body, and that's in cases where our office has already ruled on that record. So if you have submitted a uh, request for a ruling to our office, we've ruled on those records, you've received that ruling, you can withhold them under our determination. If a week later you receive another request for that exact same information, you can respond to that request without requesting a ruling from our office, you respond to it in accordance with the ruling that we had already issued, and you are permitted to do that unless the facts, law, circumstances with respect to that record have changed. To give you an example of how they could change. If you're withholding a record because it relates to a pending law enforcement file, and in between receiving the first request and the second request, that prosecution has concluded and the person was convicted. Okay? You no longer have a pending criminal case, you now have a concluded criminal case. So the law would have changed. So it's real important when you're relying on a predetermination of the type 1 variety that you ensure that the law, facts, and circumstances have not changed with respect to that determination. The second type of predetermination can be applicable to all governmental bodies or specific governmental bodies. It can apply to all governmental bodies of a certain type as designated, and it's, or it can be only, only um, applicable to a one governmental body. It depends on how we issue it. It can be applicable to everyone or one person. R depends on how the decision is issued. And it's applicable to a precise, clearly delineated category of information or records. This is a lot easier if I provide you with an example. So ORD 684, which um, many of you may be familiar with, is a previous termination, the type 2 variety, that our office issued in 2009 and it permitted all governmental bodies in the state of Texas to withhold specified categories of information without requesting a ruling from our office. ORD 684 is still in effect, uh, but it's been chipped away at a little bit by the legislature. The legislature um, has amended the Public Information Act now to with, uh, permit governmental bodies to withhold some types of information without requesting a ruling, and that's now statutorily provided. Um, the Categories of information that ORD 684 still applies to are contained on this slide. Uh, direct deposit authorization forms, I-9s, W-2s, and W-4 form, W-4 forms, uh, agendas, fingerprints, L-2 and L-3, those are law enforcement um, de declarations. Certain email addresses and military discharge records are the types of information that every governmental body in the state of Texas has a type 2 previous determination for. And there are other previous determinations, but this is the, uh, this is the most broadly <coughs> applicable one. Okay, so let's move on and talk about those 10 to 15 day deadlines. Uh, first we're going to talk about what you have to do within 10 days, then we're going to talk about what you have to do within 15 days, and then we're going to go on to the very exciting component of the presentation which talks about how to count to 10. <laughs> okay, so not later than the 10th business day, you must do these things, very important. I'm going to walk through these. Uh, these are really important for those of you who are dealing with Public Information Act requests directly, submitting briefs to our office and handling them in that fashion. And you can also refer back to this information as a resource. Um, this is all contained in Section 552.301 and 305 of the Government Code. First, you must ask for a ruling and state the exceptions that apply. You must notify the requester in writing that you have asked for a ruling and you must provide the requester a copy of the letter that you submitted to the Attorney General's office. Those are the three requirements that you have to submit to our office and have to notify the requester. 
The fourth requirement is if there is any information that you have determined may imp implicate the uh, privacy or proprietary interests of a third party, you must also notify those third parties by the 10th business day. So those are the requirements to do uh, to comply with on the 10th business day. There are more requirements that come five days later within the, on the 15th business day. You must submit the comments stating why uh, the stated exceptions apply. You must submit a copy of the written request for information. You must submit a signed statement as to the date on which the request for information was received by the governmental body or evidence sufficient to establish the date. For example, a, uh, when you submit the request, uh, the request may, if it's by email, it may have the date stamp on it. Or if you submit a copy of the envelope that has a, um, a login stamp, that would be uh, the type of information that we're talking about sufficient to establish the date. Submit a copy, very important, not your original records. Do not submit your original records to us. Submit a copy of the specific information requested or you must submit representative samples if the information is voluminous. Uh, you want to label that copy of the information or representative samples to indicate which exceptions apply. So you would have, you're going to be submitting arguments to us. You want to make sure that you take those arguments and you mark the documents in accordance with those arguments. It's very important that if you raise an exception, not only do you want to raise the exception and tell us which exceptions apply, but you also want to identify the, the records that those exceptions apply to in the actual records that you submit. <clears throat> and you want to submit a copy of your written comments to the requester. Okay, so I just talked about 10-day deadlines and 15-day deadlines. There is not a prohibition or requirement that you do those things on the 10th day or on the 15th day. In fact, it's highly recommended that you do them before that day. You, can, you cannot do them any later, right? So you can complete all of your 10 and 15 day requirements in one brief to our office on the seventh business day, on the 10th business day, on the second business day. All of those are permissible, but you have to meet the bare minimum requirements in order to be in compliance with the Public Information Act. Okay, counting business days. Counting to 10, Public Information Act style. Start counting the next business day after receiving a written request. So you do not count the day it's received, you start counting on the next day. Received means when it is physically received, not when it is finally opened. Very important for emails. If your public information coordinator is the only person who is checking email requests and your public information coordinator goes on vacation for four days and no one checks those requests while that person is gone, the deadline's been ticking the entire time since they were received. Okay, so it's very important to be routinely checking your fax box, your email box, your mail, obviously hand delivery, uh, in order to make sure that you're calculating your deadlines correctly because it is when it is actually physically received, not when it is opened. Really important, especially for emails. Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays do not count. Uh, skeleton crew days do not count. If you're closed on a skeleton crew day, it's really important that you notify our office. Uh, across the state, governmental bodies are closed for a number of reasons. And as we all know, living in Texas, uh, the weather in Austin is not the weather in some place, in any other place in Texas. So if you're closed because of weather, let us know that you were closed because of weather. If you were closed for a holiday that only your city or your governmental body acknowledges, that's just fine. But you want to make sure that we know that because every ruling that comes into our office we check and we confirm that you've complied with your 10 to 15 day deadlines. And when we look at that, we count with the typical calendar and we're not going to know every skeleton crew day, every holiday that every governmental body follows. So very important if you're closed on any day during your calculation that you notify us that you were closed, um, that you were closed on that day. Okay, so counting to 10 can be simple. Here we have a request that was received on the 2nd. We start counting the next day on Tuesday. We don't count the Saturdays and Sundays, and we end up on the 10th business day on the 16th. Really straightforward, really easy. Counting to 10 can also be tricky. So here we have a request that was received on the 18th. We have the business days counting normally, until we get to the 24th, 25th, 26th, and 27th of December, all of which were closed for various reasons. Some for holidays, some for skeleton crew days, 
None of those count as when you're counting the 10 business day deadline. It's really important though that you let us know which of those days you were closed on. We're obviously not going to count Christmas Day, but we will want to know that you were not open on Christmas Eve or the day before Christmas Eve or the day after Christmas. Uh, pick up the next week. We get to the uh, fourth business day on the 30th. Notice the request came in on the 18th and we're still on the fourth business day all the way on the 30th. The 31st, half skeleton, half holiday. That means it's a, uh, doesn't, we don't count that as a day. Full holiday for New Year's Day, picking back up on the 2nd and all the way down to the 9th. So we had a request that was received on the 18th and, the, and 10 days later, for the Public Information Act purposes, is the 9th. So really important that you focus on counting those days correctly. It matters. When you're, when you're filing a ruling with our office, we have an electronic filing system. It's brand new. Um, I shouldn't say it's brand new, it's relatively new. It's brand new in the, in the Public Information Act world. It's only been around for a couple of years. It's, uh, it allows you to submit electronic filing under the Public Information Act that complies with all of your requirements. Um, we have, we put this, this is a picture from the website that we have. If you're not familiar with the electronic filing system, I really recommend if you're a person who's submitting those requests to our office that you become familiar with it. It's very handy. Uh, in most cases, it's going to be preferable to use mail or some type of other carrier because there is a fee attached with using the electronic filing system. But if you get to 9 or 10 o'clock on a Friday and your mail is gone and you're not able to handle uh, or get a, uh, a courier or a, any other type of delivery service to take your package, you can fall back on the electronic filing system to file something and make sure you get a ruling in and you hit your deadlines. So why have I been talking so much about these 10 to 15 day deadlines? It's because failure to comply with the deadlines has serious consequences. You're not going to miss your mandatory exceptions. You can never waive a mandatory exception. So for example, there is no deadline that you can violate that would require you to release a person's um, uh, driver's license number, for example. That's confidential. You're not going to waive mandatory exceptions. But you might or you will waive your permissive exceptions. Permissive exceptions are discretionary exceptions that governmental bodies have the option to raise. You're not required to raise them. We're going to talk about a handful of them in a minute. There's a full description of them in our public information handbook. But if you miss a deadline, even by one day, then you're going to lose out on all of your permissive exceptions. And those are the big ones like attorney-client privilege, like deliberative process, like the litigation exception. So those are um, often important exceptions for governmental bodies and missing any deadline will result in waiver of those um, exceptions. Uh, this gives me a, a chance to talk about our public information handbook. We have a public information handbook. It's available on our website. It's in PDF copy, searchable. It's several hundred pages long. It includes the full text of the Public Information Act along with all of our rules related to the Public Information Act. It also includes a detailed discussion of each Public Information Act exception. It includes a detailed discussion of the procedures, how to handle issues related to costs. And so it's a really good resource for those of you who are dealing with public information and, uh, and may not be able to remember or dealing with it on a constant basis. The Public Information Handbook is an excellent resource and it's available free of charge as a PDF on our Open Government website. I really recommend uh, giving it a look and keeping it handy uh, for when you're working on these issues. We update it every year, so we just issued uh, a new one in December. Um, I'm sorry, every other year. We just issued one in December. After each legislative session, we update the handbook. So we've got a brand new handbook, and uh, it's up on our website. <laughs> recommend you give it a look. It has a full discussion of the distinction between uh, mandatory and permissive exceptions. So how do you waive permissive exceptions? There's a list. This is the same procedures that you saw back when you were looking at 10 and 15 day requirements. So failing to submit a ruling on time, failing to include the records, failing to submit a copy of the request, failing to notify the requester. These are all procedural violations that are contained in section 552.301. And if you fail to comply with them, again, it will, it will result in the waiver of your discretionary exceptions. So I keep referring to these exceptions. Uh, 
when I, when I started, we were at section 552.147. That was a number of years ago. Uh, now we're, we're far beyond that. All of the exceptions in the Public Information Act start with 552.101 and they run through the rest of that subchapter. So they're all contained in one place. The issue though is that the Public Information Act includes a section in section 552.101 that brings in every other confidentiality provision that's contained in other law. So for example, if common law makes information confidential, like common law privacy, that can come into the Public Information Act through 101. If your governmental body works under a particular provision in, in Texas statute that includes confidentiality provisions, those sections come into and apply to records through section 552.101. So although we only have um, those sections in, that are in that subchapter of the Public Information Act, we will still apply any other confidentiality provision that is, main that is contained elsewhere in, in Texas law, including, again, statutory and, and judicial cases. So we have a list of the exceptions. These are the commonly raised exceptions. I just talked about 101. We could spend a whole day talking about how each of these exceptions works. I just wanna make sure I cover them very, very briefly so you know that they're there. When you're looking at records, you're gonna know, okay, so a flag will maybe go up when you're reviewing a record that pertains to litigation. So let's walk through these very quickly so you can have a little bit of background. So section 552.102 is confidentiality of certain personnel information. This primarily pertains to employees' dates of birth. We're also gonna have 552.103, which is gonna to relate to pending or anticipated litigation. Section 552.104, which is gonna be information related to competition or bidding. Very important, that's a discretionary exception. It applies to governmental bodies, but it also applies to third parties. Section 552.107 is the attorney-client privilege. Section 552.108 uh, pertains to law enforcement records, pending law enforcement investigations, um, open law enforcement investigations, or concluded law enforcement investigations that did not result in conviction or deferred adjudication. Those are the most common exception, or most common records that are uh, covered under that section. Section 552.110, this won't matter for governmental bodies because governmental bodies can't assert section 552.110. However, third parties can. And it's important that third parties are notified if their proprietary information is maintained in records. You're required to provide that notice to them within 10 days of receiving the request. And, they're, and they are permitted to assert arguments to our office explaining how that section applies. Section 552.111, agency memoranda. This is deliberative process, um, advice, opinion, or recommendations on policy making matters, audit working papers, confidentiality of certain employee information in 552.117. 552.117, that's gonna to apply to really the um, home address, home telephone number, family member information, and, and contact information of your employees. So if you see that information in records that you're gonna be releasing, uh, you want to put up, a, you want to think about that and, and have put up a flag um, to look for that information. 552.130 for motor vehicle records. 552.136 for credit card, debit card, charge card. That's really account numbers that you can use uh, to acquire or transfer goods or services. Section 552.137 for email addresses and section 552.147 for social security numbers. Um, okay, so I just went through a handful of exceptions. Uh, they continue and there are many more in between, but those are really the main ones that we address. Uh, the exceptions that I just discussed, those would be a very large portion of the 27,000 rulings that we issue every year. So there are many more exceptions, but most of the rulings that we issue would be under one of those exceptions. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about core or super public information. Section 552.022 provides that certain categories of information are considered core public, core public information or super public information. Why do we want to talk about this information? Well, remember back when I talked about prompt release of records? Requesters are going to expect that this type of information is going to be readily available and with very few exceptions is going to be released in response to a public information request. All these categories are contained in section 552.022. There are a number of categories. Uh, the ones we see by far the most often are included in this presentation. The big one is 552.022A1. That covers completed reports, audits, and evaluations. 
but also the demographic, demographic information with respect to your employees, so name, sex, ethnicity, salary, title, and other information pertaining to employees. Information in an account voucher or contract, so contracts obviously are super public information. Uh, working papers, research material, and information used to estimate the need for or expenditure of public funds or taxes on completion of an estimate. So if you do a budget estimate, if you're putting together a budget, that, that type of information is gonna be covered under a super public um, category. Attorneys, attorney fee bills are gonna be covered under a super public category information. So if your um, government body is using a outside counsel who, and you're receiving uh, fee bills, then this type of information is going to be covered under section 022. And uh, information that's also contained in a public court record. So if a publicly filed records, you wanna be, there are very few exceptions under which you would be permitted to withhold records that have already been filed with a court. And finally, a settlement agreement to which a governmental body is a party is going to be a type of core public um, information that is gonna be super public and cannot be withheld unless there's a confidentiality provision that applies to it. So with respect to all of these records that I just listed, unless you have a specific statutory exception, they are not gonna be, you cannot withhold them under a discretionary exception. So you can't withhold them under a trade client privilege or litigation exception, um, but you can still withhold them if they contain or they are confidential under a Public Information Act confidentiality provision. Okay, so we talked about previous determinations earlier. Those allow you to withhold records um, without requesting attorney general's ruling. There are also a handful of very, speci very specific exceptions where the legislature has identified those exceptions as being uh, records that where you are permitted to withhold them without requesting a ruling. These sections are 552.130 pertaining to uh, driving information. So driver's license, motor vehicle title or registration or personal identification documents, those can be withheld. The one we see by far the most often is, is your driver's license number. Those can be withheld without requesting a ruling from our office. Section 552.136, was I mentioned earlier, it's account, bank account, uh, and access device numbers. And <coughs> under government code section 552.024, 1175, and 138, those are all exceptions that permit the withholding of personal information pertaining to employees. So home address, home telephone number, family member information is all the type of information that can be withheld under those exceptions without requesting a ruling. It's important to note with those exceptions that they require that the governmental body provide the requester with a form. So those forms are all available on our website. If you wish to withhold that type of information without requesting a ruling, then you can certainly do so, but you have to, you have to provide the requester with a specified form. And those, again, those forms, we provide them up on our website. If you go to the Attorney General's website, there is a bar at the top that says Open Government. And then uh, down from that bar, there are publications and forms that are available for you to use when you're handling that type of a, uh, that type of a form for your governmental bodies. So let's do a, a real quick review of the process so far. When you receive a, a governmental, uh, when a governmental body receives a request, there's a presumption of openness. You're gonna presume that it's open and you're gonna need a reason to withhold the records. So you're either going to promptly release the requested information you're gonna request a ruling from our office within 10 days, or you're going to withhold the information pursuant to a previous determination. On the, on the two things on the left, either promptly, with, promptly releasing or withholding pursuant to a previous determination, that ends the process, you notify the requester, and uh, you go forward from there. If you request a ruling from our office, then we're gonna issue a ruling within 45 business days. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail here in just a second. And then we're gonna either tell you then the, that the information must be withheld, that it may be withheld, or that it must be released. When a government body receives a, uh, a ruling from our office, they must file suit for judicial review if they don't uh, agree with it, or they must re uh, release the records. So that's the option when a ruling comes back that a government body does not agree with. A requester or a third party is also permitted to file suit uh, if they disagree with the conclusion that's contained in a ruling. So after a ruling, uh, after re requesting a ruling, we're going to issue an informal letter. All of our informal letters are available on our website. They're all issued within 45 business days 
or in very rare circumstances, we, um, we have the ability to get a 10-day extension and issue it within 55 business days. Uh, once the ruling is issued, we are going to provide a copy of the ruling to the requester. We're going to send the ruling to the governmental body. And we are also at that point going to provide all of the records that were submitted to our office. We're going to provide those back to the governmental body who requested the ruling. And if information has to be withheld, then we're going to identify the information that may or must be withheld contained in the records that you provided to us. And again, all of those rulings are available online. So all 27,000 rulings that we sent out last year are up and available on our website. A governmental body cannot request reconsideration of a ruling. If a governmental body wishes to withhold information, then it must file suit within Travis County against the Attorney General's office within 30 days of receiving the ruling. That's how a governmental body goes about challenging a ruling. So really important uh, to keep that in mind when you receive a ruling back. Okay, let's talk about civil remedies. 32, section 552.3215 of the Government Code is a very unique provision. It allows a requester to file a complaint regarding um, treatment under the Public Information Act, and it is a very rare circumstance because it actually requires a district attorney to provide a response to the person who files the complaint. So an individual who files a complaint under section 3215 must receive a response, either explaining why no action will be taken or that the, in, that the uh, district attorney will be filing a declaratory judgment or injunctive relief. There is also a writ of mandamus, which is much more common. So section 552.321 provides for a right to file a writ of mandamus. A writ of mandamus can be filed by a requester at any time in the request process. It can be filed right after the request is received if the requester doesn't believe that the, the government body is promptly releasing the information. It can be filed while the ruling is pending at our office, and it can be filed after the ruling is received by the governmental body. So those are all um, time frames in which a writ of mandamus can be filed by a requester in order to obtain uh, or compel a governmental body to comply with the Public Information Act, either to release records that were considered withheld or to respond to a public information request. Writs of mandamus are important. This, this part of the uh, talking about the civil remedies is important because a governmental body can be subject to attorney's fees if the, if the party who files a writ of mandamus uh, prevails in the action. So very important, um, governmental bodies do not want to be subject to attorney's fees. That's why it's very important to comply with the Public Information Act, make sure the requester is getting the response that they are guaranteed under the act and avoid this type of action. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the criminal penalties. Very important. Uh, there are a handful of criminal penalties that are provided in the Public Information Act. The first is for failure or refusal to provide access to or copying of information. If a governmental body fails or refuses to give access to, permit copying, or provide copies of public information with criminal negligence, they're subject to a violation of this provision. It constitutes official misconduct, it's a misdemeanor offense, and the uh, Violator is subject to a fine of not more than $1,000 and or not more than six months in jail. So again, very serious consequences for failing to comply with the Public Information Act. There is also an affirmative defense for failure to provide access. If a governmental body fails to provide access because it reasonably uh, relied on a court order, a court opinion, or an OAG decision, then it has an affirmative defense against uh, prosecution for uh, failure to provide information under section 552.353. Um, those again are going to apply as well if you have a pending uh, case that you filed in Travis County challenging a ruling, if you have an OAD, OAG um, ruling or decision that's up and pending with our office, or if you reasonably relied upon written instruction for the officer for public information. Those apply if you're a government official. Okay, section 552.351, which covers the destruction, removal, or alteration of public information. It's an offense if a person willfully destroys, mutilates, removes without permission as provided by this chapter, or alters public information. It's a fine not less than $25 or more than $4,000. 
and or county jail not less than three days or more than three months. It also is a misdemeanor offense. So again, very serious consequences. One thing that's important to note with respect to this section is if a government body receives a request, we're talking about governmental records and many of these records are subject to retention schedules. Uh, just like litigation, just like an audit, if a government body receives a public information request, those records really freeze and should not be disposed of until the public information request is, um, the whole process is completed. So that's where this provision really comes into play. It's important from, your, from the standpoint of retention that you uh, review and make sure that those records aren't subject to a public information request because they must be maintained during that process. Okay, so we also have distribution or misuse of confidential information. A person commits an offense if they distribute information considered confidential under the terms of Chapter 552 of the Government Code. This is also uh, official misconduct, so very serious offense if you're working for a governmental body, and a fine not more than $1,000 and or county jail of more than six months. So again, those are the three primary penalties under the Public Information Act. They're very, they all carry very serious consequences and you want to be sure that you're complying with the Public Information Act in order to avoid those criminal penalties, not to mention the civil remedies that, uh, that requesters and third parties have in responding to and handling um, issues with respect to uh, a government-wise handling of public information requests. During the 2019 legislative session, the Texas legislature made a number of significant changes to the Public Information Act. In response to these changes, our office is working on a new training video to be released later this year. However, while we're working on that training, there is one big change in the way requests are received that we want you to know about. Under the new law pertaining to requests, a person may make a written request for public information only by delivering the request to the Officer for Public Information or a person designated by that officer through one of the following methods, United States mail, electronic mail, hand delivery, or any other appropriate method approved by the governmental body. This law replaces the previous law which specifically permitted requests to be received by facsimile. The new law does, however, provide that a governmental body may specify any other appropriate method, including facsimile or electronic portal requests. Under the new law, section 552.234, governmental bodies may designate a mailing address or electronic mail address for receiving requests. If the governmental body properly posts these addresses, then the government body does not need to respond to a written request unless it is received at one of those designated addresses by hand delivery or by one of the other methods specifically approved by the government body. We're going to talk about costs under the Public Information Act very briefly. Public Information Act cost rules, cost statutes are very complex and they really depend on a number of factual determinations that are unique to each circumstance. Um, our office, as a resource in assisting you in developing a cost estimates and identifying the amount of cost that should be uh, charged to a requester in responding to a Public Information Act request, has uh, published a po uh, public information cost estimate model. It's up on our website and it provides you with all of the calculations that you would need in order to accurately and um, quickly produce a public information cost estimate that complies with all of the procedures of the Public Information Act. There are many of them, and violation of those procedures can result in the waiver of discretionary exceptions. And so it's very important that you comply with those procedures, and so we have the public information cost estimate model that is available to help you with that. We also have two hotlines. We have the Open Government Hotline. The Open Government Hotline is available to all members of the public, to members of governmental bodies, requesters, Anyone who has a question under the Public Information Act can contact our Open Government Hotline. We have a local number and a 1-800 number. If you contact the hotline, you are going to receive assistance from an attorney who is an expert in the field. Um, all of the hotline questions um, are left by message and we will reply back to all of those questions, usually the same day that we receive the call and you'll get to speak to a lawyer who's an expert on the, on the uh, Public Information Act. I talked about the complexity of those cost issues. We also have a cost hotline. The phone number is behind me. If you um, have a cost question and if you need uh, issues resolved with respect to costs, whether a requester or a governmental body, you're permitted to contact the cost hotline. We have an attorney who is an expert who deals with these issues all day, every day, 
and they are available to help walk you through the procedures and the requirements in order to uh, appropriately charge for access to records and to prepare accurate cost estimates. So those are really important and great resources that are available um, to members of the public and to government bodies who have questions with respect to the Public Information Act. Uh, finally, we have our website. On, on our website, we have all of the materials that I've discussed so far, including links to the handbook, links to the forms, and a number of other uh, pieces of guidance, including the public information cost estimate model. Lots of resources there. I really recommend if you're getting into this to go and check out our website. It's going to provide you with lots of information that you're going to need um, in working through this. Uh, finally, uh, let me give you the code for completion of this course. Thank you all very much for, for attending. If you're a government official and you need to complete a certificate, remember that that certificate must be on file with your governmental body and it's your responsibility to complete the certificate. Uh, that link is available on the training page on our Open Government website. And the code for this training is TXPIA921. That's TXPIA921. 921. Go to that website, enter in the code along with your information in order to obtain your certificate. And again, thank you very much for coming and for attending our open government training today. Thank you.